My great pleasure uh, to introduce Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick uh, and Candy Crowley, uh, anchor for CNN State of the Union. Uh, Governor Patrick is going to start uh, and, and give us remarks, and Candy uh, Crowley will uh, will uh, interview him. Uh, before he was elected to his current job, uh, Governor Patrick was the Assistant Attorney General uh, for Civil Rights under President Bill Clinton uh, and worked as a senior executive for Texaco and Coca-Cola. Uh, he was working hard in the private sector, as he has as governor, to promote the values of fairness and equality. And today he's going to talk to us uh, about jobs, unemployment, and equality. That's actually been one of the themes uh, of the last two days. Uh, and Candy Crowley, you all know, she's CNN's award-winning political correspondent. Uh, she covers presidential, congressional, and guberna gubernatorial elections, uh, and also uh, major legislative developments on Capitol Hill. So it is my pleasure to introduce Governor Patrick. Thank you for inviting me to join you this afternoon. I know that um, you've had a very full agenda these couple of days, so I'll keep my opening remarks uh, as brief as possible so we can spend more of our time together in conversation. Um, with thanks again to uh, Anne-Marie, perhaps a little more introduction is in order at the outset. Uh, I am called a liberal Democrat from a reliably blue state, so-called. Uh, in which, by the way, there are more unenrolled independents than there are registered Republicans and registered Democrats combined. I am a capitalist who believes we need to grow the economy, not just to create wealth, but also and mainly to create opportunity. And I have spent most of my professional life in and around private companies, including, as you heard, as a senior executive in two Fortune 50 companies. But I don't hate government or the other party. Though I do believe most political labels and much political orthodoxy is stale. Because I am suspicious of conventional wisdom, perhaps none more than that which says that you grow a modern market economy by cutting taxes, shrinking government, crushing unions, and waiting to see what happens next. A version of that, in a nutshell, was the approach taken in Massachusetts under 16 years of Republican governors. When I took office in 2006, Massachusetts was 47th in the nation in job creation. Real wages were declining in our state while rising across the nation. In a state where education is our calling card, our students had just experienced one of the largest per pupil spending cuts anywhere in America. Our infrastructure was crumbling, roads, rails, and bridges in a state of neglect, so much so that uh, uh, they presented imminent risks to public safety. Healthcare reform had been enacted, but not yet implemented. In fact, from 2000 to 2006, Massachusetts seriously underperformed the nation in both GDP growth and job growth. And by the way, young people and families were leaving the state. Then, not long after I took office, the global economy collapsed, adding a new level of misery and challenge. Today, I'm happy to report nearly eight years later, Massachusetts out outperforms the country on both GDP and job growth. For the last seven years, our economy grew at about twice the national rate. Last year alone, we added the most jobs in a single year than in any year since the tech boom in 2000, the fourth straight year of strong job gains. Young people and families are moving back into Massachusetts again as well. We are first in the nation in student achievement at or near the top in the world in math and science. We are also first in health care coverage with over 98% of our residents insured today, in economic competitiveness, in entrepreneurial activity, in venture funding per capita, in energy efficiency, and much more. And we've done it responsibly, balancing our budgets, replenishing our rainy day fund, one of the strongest in the country, and achieving the highest bond rating in Massachusetts history. We have our challenges and our setbacks, of course. The recovery has by no means reached everyone. But by many, many measures, Massachusetts is a more prosperous, more open, and more just state today for many people than it was in 2006. So uh, how did we get Massachusetts back in the leadership business? We shifted the paradigm, first and foremost, to a long-term strategy. This was very intentional. In my business life, 
I was struck by how much pressure there was to manage for the next quarter, to get the short-term results, sometimes sacrificing the long-term interests of the enterprise in doing so. I see more and more of that behavior creeping into the way we govern in America today, where we govern for the next election cycle or the next news cycle instead of for the next generation. That's, in fact, why I ran for office in the first place, to try to turn that around. Specifically, our strategy has been to invest in education, in innovation, and in infrastructure. Education because with some 300 universities, research institutions, and uh, teaching hospitals within 90 minutes of downtown Boston, and the world in the midst of a knowledge explosion, education is our competitive edge. Innovation because there are a handful of industries like the life sciences and biotech, clean tech, the whole range of digital technologies, and even financial services, which is more and more a tech company or a tech business. Uh, those are the kinds of industries that depend on the kind of concentration of brain power that we have. And finally, infrastructure, which I always describe as the unglamorous work of government because it supports everything else. That means roads, rails, and bridges, of course, but it also means public and affordable housing, labs and startup space at our public universities, broadband, and even health care. All the things the public builds as a platform for private sector investment and personal ambition. We didn't ignore all the uh, conventions, I have to admit, but we approached them in a more balanced way. We cut business taxes three times so that we would be more competitive, but we also closed a number of loopholes that had outlived their usefulness. We eliminated scores of old regulations, but we streamlined many others that still mattered and improve the processes of review and enforcement so that state permitting moves at the speed of business. We reform the transportation bureaucracy, our public pension and benefits systems, and underperforming schools, but in each case we did so with labor at the table. We reduced government headcount significantly and raised sales and gas taxes modestly, but only after engaging a reluctant public and a real conversation about the responsibility each one of us has to leave our commonwealth better and stronger than we found it. My point is not simply to brag about Massachusetts, although I'm loving doing so. Can I go on? <laughs> but rather to show that a strategy of investing in education, in innovation, and in infrastructure works, and to challenge the calcified conventional wisdom that says economic prosperity comes when governments tax as little as possible, spend as little as possible, and regulate as little as possible. The evidence is on our side. I want to point out a couple of other features of our success. The first is the importance we place on investing strategically. Now, I know some believe that government investment, that term, is just a clever way of describing government spending. In Massachusetts, we really are tracking and judging the return on our spending. For example, we launched a 10-year, $1 billion initiative to strengthen our life sciences and biotech sector, a natural outgrowth of that concentration of university and medical brain power that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are now um, uh, uh, halfway through that effort. We've invested about $500 million of public money in grants, tax credits, and capital improvements, which has leveraged more than $1.5 billion in private investment and created thousands of jobs. Similarly, we joined the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, used the proceeds of the carbon emissions auctions to subsidize energy efficiency measures, and surged to the top rank nationally in energy efficiency. By the by, annual average job growth in our clean tech sector is over 24 percent. I want to add that the benefits of emphasizing innovation don't only accrue to PhDs. 60% of the new jobs in the life sciences are for people with less than a four-year bachelor's degree. Manufacturing, which in our state is now largely so-called precision or advanced manufacturing, is growing 50% faster than the national growth rate and seven times the rate it did in the previous administration. A second noteworthy feature of our approach is the importance we place on collaboration. We recognize that no state government can presume to substitute for the private capital markets. But more than philosophy, the practical reality for us 
has been that our public investment has been most successful where the programs have been designed in collaboration with business and academia and where individual investment decisions have been made with input from scientific and technical experts as well as experienced business leaders. Indeed, in one signature project in western Massachusetts, a, a green high-performance computing center, our partners include five universities, both public and private, and four high-tech companies. The first time many of these institutions have worked with each other, let alone partnered with state government. The point is that we try to target our public investment, uh, in infrastructure investments, where they will catalyze private investment and the job growth that follows from it and where private sector experts actively collaborate in that. Third, we have had within reason to raise our risk tolerance. We gave generous tax credits to one solar company and it did not work out. Meanwhile, the solar industry, indeed the whole clean tech sector as I've described, has grown exponentially under the same programs. It is certain that the failure of any particular public investment will be the subject of intense public scrutiny. I get that. And yet we will not be able to make any meaningful investments in education, innovation, or infrastructure if each and every investment must carry a guarantee of successful short-term return. Just as a private investment advisor, advisor should not be judged a failure if one stock in the portfolio loses value, so too public investments should be judged on the entirety of the results and not merely on the outcome of any one project. Some fear that government investing will only serve to crowd out private funding of projects and will thus have no net positive effect. With the exception of most, though not all, transportation spending, our investments of state dollars are frequently and purposefully only 5 or 10 percent of the total capital invested. At those levels and with a determination to seek out opportunities to co-invest with private parties, we have seen no evidence of such crowding out. To the contrary, as I've said, we can show that our disciplined investment strategy has drawn, drawn additional private capital into the Massachusetts economy from around the country and around the world. Our experience over the last seven and a half years suggests an import, important role for government in fostering a robust 21st century innovation economy. By any measures, Massachusetts already reflects such an economy. And in that new economic reality, Massachusetts so shows the powerful impact that government can have by making strategic, long-term public investments in education, innovation, and infrastructure. And yet, in another sense, our approach is not at all new. In the 1950s and 60s, before conventional economic wisdom became conventional, Significant public investment in education, innovation, and infrastructure was a driving force behind America's economic success. Whether it was President Truman's support for the GI Bill, President Kennedy's call for a man on the moon, or President Eisenhower's vision for a national highway system, public investment in education, innovation, and infrastructure was once a good idea, whose time, I believe, has come again. Now, I admitted at the outset that I am a capitalist who believes we must have economic growth. But though I have been blessed to have uh, made a little money myself along the way, I do think creating opportunity is the more profound reason why economic growth matters, especially in America. And I will close with a brief reflection on that. America is the only nation in human history not organized the way countries are normally organized. We're not organized around a common religion or language or even culture. Geography doesn't explain America. We're the only nation in human history organized around a handful of civic ideas. And we've defined those ideas over time and through struggle as equality, freedom, fair play, and opportunity. That, I maintain, when all is done, is the reason we remain the envy of the world. Indeed, uh, as Israel's President Shimon Peres says, we are the only superpower whose power comes not from taking, but from giving. At a time when the chasm between the haves and the have-nots in America is growing, and the impact uh, of not just inequality, but immobility, is a reality confronting millions, we have to do what works 
to make opportunity real. I think that will include disenthralling ourselves of some of our political conventions. And when you brought up the infamous blue cards. That's a blue cards, right? <laughs> you never know what's on these things. Well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to do this. Me. So let's talk. Let's. Massachusetts sounds like a lovely place to live. <laughs> so <laughs> let's let's talk about applying what you just talked about to the country as a whole. So let me get a situationer from you, as we call it. Um, how do you think the American economy is doing? Well, so first of all, yes, Massachusetts is a great place to live. And uh, we, have, we have a lot of things going for us, January and February, and not two of them. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do think that the, uh, I think the economy is recovering. Um, it's not recovering as strongly or as fast as I think anybody would like. And you have to worry about the numbers of people in the country who are not, uh, for very understandable reasons, feeling that sense of mobility, that sense of uh, not just that circumstances are hopeful, but that their own, is it not working? Like that? Is this better? Okay, but that there are, should I repeat everything I just said? Okay, really? We don't have time. Um, I, I think we do have to worry about, and more and more people are worrying about, uh, including public leaders, uh, the fact that millions and millions of people in America are not feeling hopeful, not just about the general circumstances, but their own ability to move forward. And I do think some of that is psychological, because I think there is a psychological element in economies generally. But some of that is about um, the real issues around immobility. Uh, and I do think that there are things we can do about that. And by immobility, you mean the inability to move from this job, which has gone away, to a different job? Well, not just that. I mean, I grew up on the south side of Chicago on welfare. I'm not supposed to be sitting here, given uh, uh, how much is happening today. That see, is this a spotty for you? As it is, this this is better. Okay, um, uh, who are uh, um, who are having uh, a, a, a practically difficult time imagining how they move from the circumstances they're in, not just the job, but the whole life circumstances they're in, to another place. And that has a whole lot to do, I believe, uh, or can be improved by access not just to um, uh, uh, more schooling, but, uh, but, a, but a better quality uh, of education and the things we do to expand the economy out to the marginalized, not just up to the well-connected. And on a, a it, it's one thing to do something about that for Massachusetts. It's another thing to look at the United States, put yourself in the president's seat, which I, I know you don't do, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and tell me, what's the first thing you do? Because I think what, what happens with people who worry about their child's education or who worried about their ability to change jobs or their ability to change class, right. uh, the ability of their children to do better, I think that they look at him and think, in my lifetime, this will never happen because government can't move that fast. Well, so I think part of it is uh, is government, not all of it. I'll talk about the part that is uh, that is government, and I would give great uh, shout outs to uh, to the Obama administration, to the president personally. I think in education, the raising of uh, of, of stakes and standards is enormously important, uh, and the and and through that, the expectations of our young people um, uh, from their teachers and of themselves. I think that's incredibly important. And we have some nearly 20 years experience with that in Massachusetts. It's fits and starts, but we've got uh, the results to, uh, uh, to show for it. I do think some of the work, um, and I don't mean to jump from policy to, uh, to sort of themes, but some of the work is, is hortatory. As I said, there's a, there's a confidence that um, we look to our leaders to show in the future. And when you see the kind of sclerosis that exists um, in terms of uh, uh, legislation in this town, not so much policy, but legislation, that casts a pall on the, on the private economy as well, all apart from the substance of the legislation that, uh, that's not getting passed. So one of the pieces of legislation that isn't getting passed uh, and is not likely to pass this year is minimum wage. Yeah. Um, we saw it stymied in the Senate. It, we're unlikely to see it uh, in the House. There are, certainly on the Senate side, enough 
uh, Republicans that some people have spoken with, that I've spoken with, and Democrats who say, okay, maybe we can't get it to $10.50 an hour. What about if we raised it a dollar? And yet you have the folks on the Democratic side, uh, the Majority Leader Harry Reid, uh, it, it, certainly uh, Senator Harkin, who have said, no, no, it has to be the 1050, where the, the president has also agreed to. Is it better to just stick to that, or isn't a dollar more an hour worth trying? Well, it's a negotiation. I mean, that you know, well, there's, but there a, is there's no a negotiation. I guess that's sort of my. But I mean, well, I guess what I would say is that the only negotiation there is is public, which is to say, nobody's taught. No, well, you certainly don't get the impression that people are talking to each other um, um, outside the uh, the glare of the Klee lights. Um, you know, we we have we haven't mo raised our minimum wage yet. We're still moving debating toward, it. We're right? moving in it. The, in we're China, moving right? it. And, uh, and we might have done it a long time. You know, we have, we're 50 cents apart between the House and the Senate. But they've been at loggerheads for months because they have other stuff they're fussing about. We'll get it done before they, uh, before they fission, finish. Where the right number is between, um, you know, 10, 50, and 11, which is on the table uh, at home, I don't know. Um, but it's not that big a, a difference. They'll find they'll find a common ground. And I think we ought to have a similar kind of approach at the, uh, at the national level. And, and yours would actually go... Is that go, responsive? Is that what you were looking for? Yeah, I was, I was wondering how you would move Washington. I mean, it's, again, I, we find that governors are I don't really, have that job. So yeah. <laughs> I know, but just in case you would ever think about it, um, <laughs> okay. I, I was kind of going for how do you... I, I, honestly, since um, I would say... Boy, the, the, the late 80s, we have heard, early 90s, we've heard candidate after candidate. I'm going to change, I'm going to change the way Washington does business. I'm going to change. You heard your friend Barack Obama say that millions of times on the campaign trail, and guess what? Hasn't changed. So I'm just wondering if you've got some antidote for what ails it. No, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't have an antidote, antidote for that. I'm, I'm, uh. Yeah, I know you get you get governors who believe they have an antidote for everything, <laughs> and an opinion on 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 any on everything. I do feel like the uh, I feel like the origins of the Obama movement and of the Tea Party movement have a lot in common. Don't laugh, um, because in both cases, people were hungry for a different way of doing things in Washington. They weren't satisfied with the way things are done in Washington. Um, I think the, P, the Tea Party has evolved, um, you know, in a in a harsher direction, in my view. Um, but uh, to the point where it is where compromise is thought of as a sign of weakness, um, or uh, uh, or or the failure of principle, and that's a problem. But what happens in Washington? This is the point I want to make. Is up to us, us as voters. It's not up to our representatives. We get the government we deserve. And if people keep sitting it out and leaving it to the pundits and the experts and the money people, instead of working it at the grassroots, which by the way is how the president won in the first place, then we will continue to get what we have. Let me ask you about, what, and, and you touched on it in your remarks. We, we, I think we found out in April that the American middle class is used to be the wealthiest middle class compared to um, their, their colleagues or their peers in other nations. Now we see that Canada has probably overtaken us and, and that many other countries, their middle class is growing uh, as ours seems to be shrinking. Why is that? Well, I, I, you know, I, follow the, I, fo I follow the reporting and the commentary uh, about that. It, I think a, ho a whole lot of it has to do, as I was saying earlier, is this business of mobi mobility. The the uh, the latter for me, uh, from uh, from poverty on the south side of Chicago to uh, uh, to a to the middle class, um, was education, and uh, I, I don't think you have to go to um, you know an independent boarding school and, and Harvard College. Um, in fact, I'm certain you 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 don't. But that that avenue is uh, um, is not as well traveled um, today. Let me give you another example. There are 200, I told you we've been doing very well in terms of job growth at home, but there are 220,000 people looking for work in Massachusetts right now and 150,000 vacancies. And what those employers are telling us is that they can't find the people 
to do the, with the skills they need to do the jobs they have. So what does that tell us about what our schools are doing and what our training programs are doing? And how do we take that learning at the point where policy touches people and make the changes to make those connections so people can move forward with their, uh, uh, with their lives? And we've been working on that, we, but we haven't nailed it yet. And one of the things that I also find really interesting is that the parents of millennials, so the new generation of parents, do not believe that their children are going to do better than they do. And it's the first generation that comes that way. It speaks to a, with all apologies to Jimmy Carter, a malaise, mm. it seems to me, that people look at how we're ranking in education and science and math and, and all of those things compared to our uh, to other countries. Uh, what our middle class is doing, our poor are getting poor, our middle class is shrinking, the rich are getting richer, and there is this feeling. Yeah that America, and I know no politician ever says this, oh, but there is a feeling out there that America has seen better days. You know what, we, we have uh, the National Governors Association, as you know, gets together a couple times a year, one, one time here in Washington. And I was at a, an NGA meeting, uh, Candy, a few years ago when someone, one of the presenters, asked that question of all the governors sitting around the room, and everybody was there. And he said, how many of you are better off than your parents were? And lots of hands went up. In fact, I think everybody's hand went up. And then he asked, how many of you think that your children will be better off than you? And very few hands went up. So it's not that politicians won't say it, or it, maybe they'll just say it silently. They try by not raising to campaign on it. No, of course not. Yeah. Of course not. But, you know, I, I feel like, the, like our, our greatest lurches forward in history in this country has, have been when, when uh, we have set goals for ourselves as a nation. And one of the great tensions I see right now, and I see it coming mainly from the Tea Party, is that it, ra they raise real questions about whether we, we want a nation rather than an, a loose association of states. And there's a difference. It seems to me we ought to have, and it's not that uh, the federal government should set all goals, but there are certain fundamental goals around global competition in particular and, uh, and around those uh, American ideals I talked about, particularly opportunity, that we should reach, and I believe can in time reach consensus again at the federal level. You know, Governor, in the, I, I grew up in the Midwest actually in, in Missouri, so I even know where Chicago is. Yeah. And um, I, I find um, that I hear some urgency um, it, when you talk to what we like to call the normal people. Um, in their voices when they talk about their children or when they talk about their jobs and a real feeling that government is always talking about, let's set goals, yeah, let's by 2030 make sure that our kids all score well and this, that. It's too late for their kids in 2030. It's too late for their job in 2030. And so there seems to be nothing kind of, nothing simple, and I understand that, but just on the on the right road, if you ask how many people, people how and what they, whether they think the country's going in the right direction? Over well, I think it's in the 60 percentiles. It's the wrong direction, mm. and honestly, we're kind of in a recovery. Mm. So I, I just wonder about those people who right now look at their lives and think it's blowing up here. So, so I, I see that and we get that uh, we get that at home. In fact, you you, you heard me talk about, it and I often do. Um, the importance of governing for the long term, and I I, I want you to know I'm very clear that that is not the sensibility of the people I serve uh, at home necessarily. It's not the first place they go because it's not how we think about policy making or problem solving for that matter in this, in this country. So many of the goals we set were not about things that we were going to accomplish in uh, my first or second uh, terms. But once we got on that path, things started to happen. A lot of these results I, I talked about were not results we expected to be able to brag about before I left office, but we still, but they begin to accrue and the pace picks up because we're very focused on a few things that we know will make a difference. One of the things we also read, and not to be Debbie Downer, but is that... Um, it's very unlike you, Kate. I know. <laughs> is that... Um, China, by the end of the year, is likely to become the world's largest economy. Should that worry us? Well, I'm competitive, so it, it worries me. Um, but I, I think uh, it doesn't have to be so. I mean, China is a, uh, I've been to um, China a number of times. I did business 
in China when I was at Coca-Cola, of course, and I've, I've been there um, two times on, on uh, missions as, as, uh, as governor. And they have a lot um, of, uh, I was going to say advantages, a lot of differences. I thought you were going to um, say a lot of people. But they got a lot of people, yeah. that's for sure. I remember, right, have you you've been, you've, have you ever ridden that maglev that goes, the train that goes from the airport to downtown uh, Shanghai? It's, it's incredible, and, and it's there in, you know, a few minutes. I think this is a distance of, uh, um, of 12 or 15 miles. Now, they made, they put that up really quickly. It's a straight line, and they told everybody who was in the way to get out of the way. They didn't ask. They told everybody to get out of the way. There are some trade-offs I think we make in a democracy that I think are trade-offs we ought to make because we're uh, a democracy, and I celebrate. But at the same time, I will say that the, uh, while we had, when I was there the first time as governor, we visited a number of life sciences companies that were doing their manufacturing, Massachusetts life sciences companies that were doing their manufacturing in, uh, in China. Um, since that first visit, and that was in 2007, Many of those companies are bringing their manufacturing home to Massachusetts. And we've been thinking about and working on how to make that environment work for them, and that's one of the reasons why they're coming home. Would the environment work better for the U.S. and bring more U.S. companies home if there were no corporate tax rate? I don't know about no, but we certainly have to have a... Uh, um, uh, we, have to, we have to fix a corporate tax system that encourages... Or let me put it differently. Makes it harder to repatriate. Um, overseas earnings. And I, you know, by the way, there's a consensus, I think, among uh, business people across the political spectrum on, on that, I think. You're looking out here because maybe there's somebody who's going to disagree with me. I actually was looking at the clock. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, no, we, we have time. I'm watch. sorry. No, no, I would not. I was just, you know, getting my bearings, that's all. Um, I, 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 look, when I was, when I was um, uh, working in companies or serving on, on, on company boards, I can't think of a single decision we made based on the, on the tax rate. Not a single investment decision we made based on the tax rate. The tax rate or well, tax... Well, is it possible that there are decisions not being discussed? Well, that there are things not being discussed because of the tax rate? Not because in the, we know that, comparatively speaking, the corporate tax rate here is really high. Well, let me, uh, let me, let me just... The, where I was going with that is, um, um, first of all, I, they, they better not have been having those discussions without me in the room in those, in those roles, uh, the ones I was referring to. But um, what I meant where I was going was uh, the tax rate or the tax... Um, or, the, or a tax benefit, was a closer, right? It's, a, it's not where you started the conversation, but it might have been how you resolved the conversation at, uh, at the end. And a combination of um, tax simplification and rate change and a harmonization with uh, the economies um, where we compete and want to compete is very, very good, in my view, in a, uh, uh, in a globally competitive uh, market, marketplace, if we really mean to have a globally competitive marketplace. And by the way, I think revenue um, is not going to be jeopardized if we get that, if we get that right. If, by bringing down corporate tax rate. But not just the lower. rate, but it also simplifying, simplifying the, right. um, the systems, eliminating a lot of these uh, loopholes, particularly ones that, uh, that can't be shown uh, to be current in how they uh, uh, encourage uh, investment and uh, and enabling the free flow of capital and the return on that capital uh, across uh, uh, across uh, national lines. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about health care. I think probably everybody here knows that it was compared to uh, the President's Afford Affordable Care Act, who uh, Mitt Romney was uh, in Massachusetts as governor um, when it went into effect. Tell me now, looking at the Massachusetts uh, health care system. Is there anything you'd change about it? Is it working perfectly, or are there things you need to change? Uh, let's see. We are 98, I think today, 98.5% insured, 99.5% of children. I don't think there's another state in America that can touch that. 90% of our residents um, report that they uh, have access to a primary care physician and have seen their physician in the last six months. We're healthier on a whole host of levels. Um, uh, measures. We are, um, uh, it's added 1% of state spending to the budget, so it hasn't been a, a budget buster. Uh, and by the way, it's popular. Healthcare reform in Massachusetts 
um, polls in the sort of seventy percent approval range. The ACA in Massachusetts polls fifty fifty. They're the same thing, right? <laughs> They're the same thing. I mean, I do think we we have been selling it harder and longer and more deliberately. They've been in place longer as well. Well, so. but those some of those numbers go back go back a while. Now our our website has given us heartburn. Right. Um, I wish that weren't so, especially after having engaged, it turns out, the same vendor who built the federal website um, to, build, uh, uh, to build ours, and that's enormously um, uh, frustrating. But, uh, you know, can, can I just say, I know I'm going on, but um, that we had an advantage, have an advantage at home that the president hasn't had at the, uh, at the national level. In our case, we had a very broad coalition of business, labor, uh, medical professionals, advocates, and so on, policymakers who came together to invent health care reform, and then they stuck together to revise it as we went along because we were learning as we went. And there have been four or five major pieces of legislation um, to, uh, uh, to refine it. And the president doesn't have that kind of, uh, um, that kind of set of circumstances. What's wrong with Obamacare? Well, there's a lot to like about it. Um, I think the uh, you know, one frustration, one frustration that, uh, that that we have in Massachusetts is that the reimbursement rate, although pretty good, um, is really good for the states that weren't doing anything around health care reform before the ACA went into effect, and less good for those of us who were um, uh, who were out in front. Um, and that you know, I'll get over that, but I wish it weren't. Uh, I wish it weren't. Uh, I wish it weren't so. It's, um, it's complicated, maybe more than necessary, um, in terms of the numbers of different kinds of subsidies, uh, the different sources of, uh, of, uh, of subsidies. You know, there are a lot of folks that had, to, that had a piece of that drafting, so I, I, I get that. I, it, it, there'd be ways to make it uh, uh, simpler, and we will learn about those and others as we go along. But as I say, if you don't have a coalition that's willing to come back to Congress and say, now it's time to, to fix this without the debate being whether to repeal it entirely, that's a very difficult um, conversation to, uh, to have. So if you had to wave a magic wand in terms of how it affects Massachusetts, which is probably minimal compared uh, to other states, since you're already highly insured there, um, what do you think is the most problematic, either in, quote, bending the cost curve or in getting everybody covered? or what's So one, one big difference between um, uh, the health reform that Governor Romney signed, um, we don't call it Romney Care anymore because it went into effect the day I took office, so we, I think we should start calling it Patrick Care. Oh. <laughs> as long as it's working as well as it is. Uh, <laughs> Seriously, I, I, the one, one, um, uh, one thing that, that one big difference is that uh, the, the bill go, the governor signed was just about access. They put the question of cost off to another day. We did cost as one of those follow-on um, uh, pieces of legislation. Um, there's much more around cost containment in the ACA, and that's a good thing. So that's helped us. That, together with our own... Um, legislation has meant that what were double-digit annual base premium increases are down to less than 3% year over year um, for the last couple of uh, years. That's been, that's been really great. Um, what would I, you know, I would, back to simplicity. Um, you know, we do, we, we have not done our subsidies by uh, tax rebates, which is the a centerpiece of the uh, of the ACA, and it means that people have to come out of pocket before they get it back. Or you know, that's I like it our way. Um, and, and a final question as our minutes run out here tomorrow, tenth anniversary of uh, the top court in Massachusetts um, uh, saying that uh, it was unconstitutional to ban same-sex marriage. So you were the first state. Uh, to allow a legal same-sex marriage. So in those 10 years, can you look at it and say, this benefit has come to Massachusetts because of this, or this negative has happened as a, a result of that? So, you know, the, the sky hasn't fallen, the, the ground didn't open and swallow us all up. The, uh, somebody somewhere has done a study about the numbers of uh, same-sex weddings that happened in Massachusetts while we had a 
you know, we, we cornered the market on right. that. I don't know what that number is. I don't really care. The, the, the main point is that we affirmed an ancient principle, which is that people come before their government as equals. And that makes us proud. There have been a lot of people that have referred to this movement for um, lesbians and gays as the, this era's civil rights movement. Do you see it that way? I think it is. I know the sensitivity among uh, some civil rights uh, leaders that you can't you know, sort of equate that with the struggle of, uh, of African Americans to um, break free of Jim Crow. And, uh, and I, I, I get that point. I get that point, too. But, the, you know, there's a civil rights is a relay race for justice, as one friend of mine describes it. You, you do everything you can in your time, and then you hand the baton to, uh, uh, to, to others. And um, it's not that I'm declaring we have won uh, the civil rights questions around race by any means, um, but um, there is a common American interest in the expansion of justice. It is. It goes back to who we are. Uh, so I, yeah, I think it is a civil rights um, question, and I, it's, it's. There's been a remarkable amount of progress, both in terms of laws and the changing of people's attitudes in the decades since that first decision. And when you look at it in the same light as civil rights, will this take a federal ruling or a federal law of some sort? Or do you think this will be a kind of a state by state? Because as you know, yeah. there are, I think, something like 30 states that have specifically banned same-sex marriage. How do you see this? I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. It, you know, the, the, uh, the court's DOMA decision was pretty, pretty uh, huge. Um, and I do think, um, you know, all the, po the national polling indicates um, attitudes are, are changing. And, I, I, you know, I, I think people will, you know, I guess I would say justice, I believe, uh, tends to win in the end. Um, in the same way as Dr. King much more eloquently said that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. I do think it takes people to bend that, uh, to bend that arc. And I think that as people realize, even those who, um, maybe especially those who don't approve or are uncomfortable with same-sex mar marriage, that they don't have to go to a same-sex wedding, even though one may be happening somewhere in their village or town or, uh, or state, that um, some of the same kind of progress that we have made around race will happen around the LGBTQ community. Governor DeVal Pender, Massachusetts. Thanks for stopping Thank by. We much. ran out the clock. I really appreciate your Thank time. You